So good morning, everyone. Uh, the usual rules in relation to these sorts of webinars, uh, please uh, mute your microphone, switch off your camera, avoid taking control of the PowerPoint slides and any questions, please put them on the chat function and we'll deal with them at uh, the end of the seminar. Standard disclaimer, probably even more appropriate in a presentation like this. Uh, the importance obviously of giving due consideration to the specifics of any particular case you have. So business interruption insurance and COVID-19. Some of you may have attended a seminar uh, we gave uh, online back in April when we talked about the impact of COVID-19 on potential claims. And the most significant event to have happened since then is the FCA test case. What we propose to do today is to give you a whistle stop tour through the judgment, uh, which may uh, help you not have to fully digest the whole 162 pages yourself, or at least give you some pointers as to specific areas you might want to be looking at and some of the key themes which emerge from the judgment, as well as potentially some of the arguments which arise out of it and points which are likely to be taken on appeal. Uh, I'm Hugh Sims and I'm presenting uh, this talk with James Wibberley and Jay Jugasia. So the decision itself was handed down on the 15th of September 2020 uh, in impressive speed uh, with much of the work done over the summer vacation and it's a review of uh, eight different insurers policies specimen policies chosen by the FCA as a test case to determine issues of principle in relation to policy coverage under various specimen wordings underwritten by the defendants in respect of claims by policyholders to be indemnified for business interruption losses arising in the context of COVID-19 and the advice used by the UK government in consequence. I say UK government uh, but of course there are some differences between uh, the English, Welsh and Scottish governments. I don't propose in this talk to talk too much about the Scottish position. I will occasionally refer to the Welsh position where there's a, an obvious difference, but by and large, uh, uh, the UK government is um, a suitable abbreviation to use. It was a decision of the divisional court of uh, uh, Lord Justice Flo and Mr Justice Butcher and one of the perhaps interesting features of the judgment is notwithstanding the various uh, different points which arose, both of them managed to reach consensus between themselves on the different issues. Whether that is so uh, in relation to an appeal to the Supreme Court remains to be seen. The purpose of the case was to give declaration as to issues of principle in relation to policy coverage in the main, but it also considered questions of causation and uh, Jay Jagazia is going to mainly focus on that particular area and in particular the decision of Orient Express and the observations made by the court in that respect and it also considered some questions as to prevalence of COVID-19 and how that might be proved in any particular case and James Wibberley is going to sweep up the tail so to speak and uh, give us uh, some thoughts arising out of the judgment in relation to how you might proceed in relation to cases you've got in relation to proof and prevalence. The context of the decision is, is important to have in mind and in particular in paragraph 80 of the judgment it was emphasised that the court was being asked to construe a number of wordings which contain non-damage extensions to the standard business interruption cover provided by the relevant insurers. That standard cover is contingent on the occurrence of physical or material damage to the insured premises. Uh, the court went on to note there is no dispute before the court about whether there is cover under such standard BI cover. Uh, I just pause to note before we dive into the judgment that as a result of that, uh, the court did not consider any wider argument as to the meaning of damage and whether or not on, it, on any particular policy uh, it might in fact include temporary loss of use of premises. And you may recall we referred to a decision of the, the Canadian court, MDS and Factory Mutual in March of this year, which appeared to open the door potentially to run that argument. That argument wasn't run 
in uh, this case, and it remains to be seen whether or not uh, a, an English court would be responsive to that argument or not. Again, that may be uh, dependent on the form of policy you have and its wording. But I simply note uh, that right at the outset, that the context of this uh, case is extensions to standard cover. Secondly, in relation to what was before the court, obviously the FCA was uh, seeking to represent the interests of the policyholders and the insurers were representing their own interests, uh, but it was not a trial involving any dispute of fact or expert evidence. There was an agreed statement of facts and it really the uh, focus was on the questions of interpretation arising in relation to the specimen wordings and uh, uh, the court was set up in such a way that it appeared very likely indeed that an appeal would go directly to the Supreme Court and indeed uh, uh, that was confirmed at the hearing uh, 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 where the declarations which were to be made were debated uh, last week on the 2nd of October and the court granted leapfrog certificates to uh, the parties to take such points as they considered appropriate uh, uh, to the Supreme Court, subject of course to the Supreme Court uh, stating they're willing to hear it. And I'm sure they will be. So the position is, is that it might be said that a, a large part of this is who is uh, going to open the batting in the Supreme Court. But uh, I don't think it's as simple as that for, for a number of reasons. Firstly, in relation to the question of certain points, it's likely that not all of them will necessarily be going to the Supreme Court. I'll come back to that. Secondly, insofar as you're dealing with claims looking at historic claims or indeed claims in relation to uh, the position in relation to uh, uh, insurance moving forward, this judgment is obviously going to be highly persuasive, at least until such time uh, as another judgment uh, comes out on the subject. So uh, that is the context for the judgment. And as I alluded to, I'm going to start off with some heavy lifting in relation to the coverage issues and try and give you a, a, a tour through that and some highlights in relation to that. We're then going to move on to causation and trends for a more colourful section of the talk from Jay uh, uh, and uh, finally prevalence and proof issues uh, by Jay. Before I go into that, the judgment structure um, is set out on this page and you'll see that in broad terms, they, they started off in a fairly conventional way by going through the principles of construction and they went through the various different categories of clauses they were looking at uh, and then dealt with issues of causation and prevalence. We broadly intend to follow that structure. Key timeline events, I'm sure this will all be uh, familiar to you all and I don't propose to spend much time on it. I've given you the references to the judgment uh, uh, sections where you can find the various different events. And all I was really going to say in relation to this is, is that uh, the reason why the timeline had some significance was, was for two reasons. One to do with the question of uh, when a policy might be triggered in terms of coverage, but also secondly, to do with the question of assessing loss uh, uh, and had an impact the trends clauses position. Uh, the court analysed each different categories of business by, very, by reference to a list of categories of businesses which are set out in the judgment. I don't propose to go through all of those today but they may have some bearing on a claim uh, you would wish to consider uh, bringing or defending when analysing the judgment and I just note it here um, for the sake of the record. So principles of construction um, the short route to this is just simply to read the last sentence in paragraph 61, which is uh, the sentence reading, the ordinary principles of construction apply. Uh, if you want the slightly longer route, you look and read through some of the other passages in the judgment, which trotted out uh, fairly well-known standard uh, uh, principles uh, in relation to contractual construction, in relation to it being an objective test, based on the information known to the reasonable bystander at the time of the contract, uh, 
uh, uh, there was some discussion about the principles in rainy sky and using uh, uh, the questions of commercial uh, sense and common sense where there's ambiguity. And there was also some discussion about uh, the extent to which the contra proferentum principle might be applied in, in relation to interpretation of exclusion clauses. And the court refers to a decision of the deputy in Crowden and QBE um, as uh, authority for the proposition that insurance exclusions are not necessarily to be read on the basis of contra proferentum principles. In other words, not necessarily to be construed against the insurer. Uh, because they form part of the definition of what is covered by the insurance. But in certain instances, that principle may kick in. Ultimately, uh, the judgment didn't tend to rely on that, certainly not as a first line of, 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 of reasoning in relation to the uh, instant specimen policies we're looking at. So let's start off with the first category of cases which the court considered which involved disease clauses. The two other categories of cases the court looked at were what was called hybrid clauses and the third uh, prevention of access or similar uh, clauses. Uh, in relation to uh, the hybrid, of course, those were hybrid of disease and prevention of action, uh, prevention of access wording. So disease clauses there were various different specimens, and these policies were written by RSA, uh, Agenta, MS Amlin, and QBE. They started off with RSA 3 uh, uh, as their model, uh, uh, which was then built on in terms of the reasoning and consideration later on. And the key words in relation to the policies were provided indemnity following the occurrence of a notifiable disease within a radius of 25 miles of the premises. And in relation to the various different uh, wordings, of course, some had following, some had arising from, some had as a result of. That didn't make a huge amount of difference to the way that the court approached it. Some referred to any notifiable disease, some occurrence of a notifiable disease, others arising from any human infectious or human contagious disease. Again, uh, not any significant difference in terms of approach in relation to their, any of those different formulations. And then there were specific uh, uh, location or, or, or geographical radiuses specified in relation to the clauses, such as within 25 miles or one mile, uh, and some use the word within the vicinity of the premises. So there were location uh, wordings and uh, I'll come back to those in due course as the extent to which they made any difference. Uh, but in broad terms, uh, uh, the those with disease clauses were uh, uh, the winners, with, with two exceptions in relation to two QBE uh, wordings. And the court uh, ultimately concluded that uh, in relation to an outbreak of a disease, it was uh, uh, not necessary to uh, prove that the outbreak of the disease within the locality alone was the cause of uh, 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 the um, uh, business interruption and the actions of the government. And they were satisfied that a wide approach should be taken to the interpretation of these clauses. A key part of the reasoning in relation to both construction and uh, linked question of, of causation in relation to RSA 3 can be found in paragraph 111 of the judgment um, when they were considering the question of uh, the use of the word following and what that meant. And they concluded that following uh, was a looser causal relation than proximate cause, uh, uh, which uh, they would regard as being clearly satisfied by the occurrence of a case of the disease within the radius specified. If that occurrence was part of a wider picture, which dictated the response of the authorities and the public, which itself led to the business interruption or interference. They went on to say, even if the word following imports the requirement of proximate causation, we would consider that given the nature of the cover as we consider it to be, this is to be regarded as satisfied in a case in which there is a national response to the widespread outbreak of a disease. In such a case, we consider that the right way to analyze the matter is that the proximate cause of the business interruption is the notifiable disease of which the individual outbreaks form indivisible parts. So 
Important to note, therefore, in the context of disease clauses, uh, uh, the fact that this was a widespread outbreak of the disease beyond the particular uh, uh, geographical location specified within the policy was not fatal on most of the wordings of the policies. Uh, uh, and reliance on a, a particular general exclusion by to one of its policies uh, was given fairly short shrift in the judgment. The exclusion ostensibly appeared to uh, exclude a, a very wide um, a, a range of activity. Uh, um, and um, the court, however, at paragraphs 115 to 117 of the judgment, uh, gave it fairly short shrift by noting that the exclusion had all the hallmarks of one which had been included without detailed consideration of the extent to which its terms might, if applied literally, cut down specific covers uh, provided in the insurance. So that was an example of the of the court viewing a, a, an exclusion clause as not being effective to cut down the specific. And that may be said to reflect an orthodox approach to contractual construction where you have a conflict between two different provisions where you have the specific and something more general. Moving on in relation to some of the other issues in relation to the disease clauses, uh, uh, noteworthy in relation to the RSA 4 clause, uh, the fact that the, uh, the use of the word within the vicinity was used in one of the clauses in the RSA 4 clause uh, was construed uh, widely, uh, vicinity was, was, was construed widely in that context for um, some, some policy specific reasons, but also because the court considered that concept could be taken to include a, a very broad area. In fact, the whole of, of England and Wales on the, on the particular facts there. Come back to the question of the use of the word vicinity later on. Uh, I, I'll skip through the other clauses. They're set out there in relation to uh, the ultimate conclusions in relation to them. But as I've indicated, um, Argenta, MS Amlin and QB1, broadly speaking, followed the approach in relation to the RSA3 clause and uh, there was not any significant uh, uh, difference in relation to those. There was some slight difference in the wording as to whether it required uh, a, a, a disease uh, to be um, manifested or occurred. Manifested was construed in this context as being symptomatic, um, whereas occurrence wasn't necessarily viewed in the same way. It was viewed in a wider way. Uh, but you can look at those specific provisions of the judgment yourself where you have those wording to look at those more carefully and closely. Uh, in relation to QB2 and QB3, they were in this, these wordings were in a slightly different form, uh, which uh, related to um, uh, occurrence of a notifiable disease within a radius of 25 miles and which used the word uh, event uh, in relation to the definition of uh, the cover which was provided and also use the word incident and coupling uh, those two together, the court concluded that by reason of the use of word of events and incident, this in fact was a more narrow and localised clause and therefore a wider pandemic um, uh, uh, did not uh, result in cover being provided. So losers were uh, for the policyholders uh, QB2 and 3 winners, obviously, for QB2 and 3 insurers. Hybrid clauses I'm going to deal with uh, fairly quickly because in broad terms, they can be um, analysed as largely following the uh, disease uh, clause uh, interpretation provisions. Uh, you'll note that they're called hybrid clauses because uh, they are provided as providing cover in relation to financial losses resulting from an interruption caused by an inability to use premises due to restrictions imposed by a public authority following an occurrence of any, uh, note the obvious error there, human infectious disease. So in, in those circumstances, uh, the, the, there was a combination of both disease provisions and uh, uh, prevention of access provisions. Uh, and in broad terms, the court followed uh, the disease clauses interpretation uh, in relation to those clauses. There was some debate in relation to uh, these clauses as to whether or not um, the question of restrictions imposed by the public authority, actions imposed by the public authority 
it required mandatory or advisory uh, actions on the part of the government. In this context, the court concluded it was the former. Uh, that's to be contrasted it, it with other clauses where in the context of prevention of access, the wording was not simply prevention of access, but also hindrance in relation to the business activities of the business. And where the use of the word hindrance applies, uh, the court was willing to adopt a wider approach to the type of government advice or activities which would lead to uh, a trigger in relation to the policy provisions. Uh, in relation to uh, the question of an inability to use, uh, the court uh, concluded that uh, what was necessary in this, respect, in this respect was beyond simply impairment of normal uses. And uh, uh, generally speaking, and we'll come on to this in due course in the prevention of access uh, uh, policies, but prevention of access was interpreted to, to require closure in relation to access in the, in the, in the, in the whole. Uh, whereas uh, if the uh, if business interaction cover uh, contemplated simply hindrance rather than pre simply prevention of access, uh, then uh, a, a wider approach was taken in relation to what that meant. Skipping then on to prevention of access uh, clauses. The uh, general approach to prevention of access clauses was uh, more insurer friendly is the overall description that I'd give to it. It uh, started off with wording in the ARCH policy, which actually was not, not particularly typical of all the other policies, but which was drawn in quite wide terms. You can see on this slide, uh, the, the policy was drawn up on the basis of it providing cover for prevention of access to the premises due to the actions or advice of a government or local authority due to an emergency which is likely to endanger life or property. It's important to note here in this context and also later on in Jay's uh, talk that the insured peril was identified here as not simply the emergency, but the interruption resulting from the composite peril of the disease and the government's actions in relation to it. On the question of prevention of, uh, of, of access, as I stated a few moments ago, uh, uh, prevention uh, uh, it necessitated closure. There was also some debate about the types of business activity that uh, might take place. And the example was given of restaurants who then put on takeaways. And uh, that depended to some degree on what the previous activity of those particular businesses were uh, and whether or not they were closed for that specific purpose or not. So you need to look at the context in which that arose. Um, some losers in relation to, or obviously losers in relation to prevention of access, the ecclesi ecclesiastical policy, something of a snakes and ladders in relation to this particular uh, uh, policy uh, wording where the court uh, concluded that on the facts, the exclusion in this case did bite so as to prevent cover in relation to the ecclesiastical policy. His cox, uh, uh, the uh, uh, non-damage denial of access cover in this respect, in, in included the word incident and um, that was considered to be significant and harmful to uh, cover uh, being applied or, or applicable in relation to uh, uh, the, the denial of access cover. So where you see the word uh, event or incident, uh, that's a warning sign and a potential problem sign for the, ins the ins uh, uh, policy holder because that tends to indicate, according to this court, uh, that the policy provisions are intended to be narrow or localised. Uh, and so therefore, uh, in response to, for example, a bomb scare in the locality or something uh, localised of that nature, not in relation to a wider cover. MSA, MSA1, uh, I set out the policy wording here because it was more typical of the types of policy wording that they looked at more generally in relation to prevention of access. And you can see that provided cover for loss resulting from interruption or interference with the business following action by the police or other competent local civil or military authority following a danger or disturbance in the vicinity of the premises. The court ultimately concluded again in relation to uh, this clause that this provided localised cover only. And it's worth just contrasting the approach in relation to this uh, aspect of the judgment with um, the, the paragraph I read to you 
a few moments ago in relation to disease clauses. So in paragraph 436, uh, the court concluded that in relation to the words following a danger or disturbance in the vicinity of the premises, that counsel for the insurer was right that these words demonstrate the cover under the clause is a narrow localised form of uh, cover. And they referred to uh, the paradigm examples of bomb scares or gas leaks, etc. And in this context, they, they concluded that the undefined term vicinity does have a local connotation of the neighbourhood. And they didn't consider that the entire country could be considered uh, or described as being in the vicinity of the insured premises. And it followed from that, that on the construction of the um, activity of the competent uh, authority clause that they were looking at, that the government action in imposing the regulations in response to the pandemic cannot be said to be following a danger in the vicinity, in a sense of the neighbourhood of the insured premises. Now, it may be said that uh, the use of the word local within that specific clause emphasise it being a local and targeted approach. But one wonders whether or not the uh, analysis adopted in paragraph 113 is readily reconcilable with the analysis adopted in 436. In one one sorry one one three in one 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 of the of the judgment one hundred eleven of the judgment, the court said you can't really divide out COVID into uh, separate little outbreaks of disease for the purposes of construing it. It said it, it, it uh, an outbreak of the disease is indivisible and must be treated as forming part of the uh, the government's reaction to it. So it, it's a little bit odd in these circumstances for the, the court to adopt such a, a, a such a different approach, one might have thought, in relation to prevention of access. Uh, whether or not this point is taken on appeal is another matter because the FCA uh, uh, ultimately decided that they would uh, uh, bring this test case to try and re achieve clarity and they seem keen on the idea of trying to reach a final uh, decision on the matter and implementing measures to ensure that insurers pay out on the uh, uh, wording as interpreted so far, but uh, it, it's interesting to note that the insurers do seem to be wanting to try and attack the uh, reasoning in relation to paragraph 111 and whether or not COVID can be viewed in this indivisible way, and that might give rise to a reopening of, of the argument in relation to the prevention of access cover as well, uh, because it seems to me that there's a potential tension there between those two um, lines of reasoning, which may not be uh, justified by reference simply to uh, uh, that event. And one poses the question as to whether or not uh, the court was unwilling to read the word only into the clauses in disease clauses, uh, but seems to have read the word only into uh, the uh, prevention of access and denial of access cover. Uh, so as to provide that effectively in relation to most denial of access covers uh, on this court's reasoning, unless you can show that the danger or disturbance is within uh, the particular vicinity or one mile or 25 miles uh, and that the action taken is in response to that danger, uh, um, then, then you, you can't prove your case. So take the example of two towns near each other, uh, which uh, are outside that radius, but have some hotspots of COVID and uh, a, a government action or local competent, competent local authority action is taken to adopt increased measures in relation to lockdown measures or restrictions. You'd probably be struggling uh, on the basis of the reasoning of this court to have effective COVID in relation to COVID for, uh, on the basis of some of the passages set out in this judgment. However, uh, of course, each uh, clause needs to be construed in its own particular setting and context and may have some subtle differences in wording. So, uh, uh, for example, if the policy wording doesn't have the word incident, uh, that may itself be a factor, uh, 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 as uh, may uh, other particular small changes and nuances in the wording. But that's the overall theme in relation to prevention of access. And I'm conscious of the time, so I'll try and skip through these particular points by just drawing your attention to the fact that in certain contexts, the court was willing to interpret action, uh, government action in some of these clauses as including advice. Uh, 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 and um, in relation to some of the clauses, 
Uh, they covered not just prevention of access, but also hindrance of access and use. Uh, and different approaches were taken by the courts in relation to those. Uh, uh, again, I've emphasized the, the concepts and the use of the word in vicinity, which points towards more narrow cover. Uh, Zurich uh, were successful in terms of their arguments in this respect, similar to MSA 1. And uh, in, in that context, uh, they were um, winners alongside um, QBE and um, ecclesiastical. So I think that probably covers my section of the talk. The only additional thing I was just going to briefly note is that uh, in terms of appeals, uh, on the 2nd of October, the court granted leapfrog permission in relation to all these different points. But in particular, the FCA, the indications are that the FCA uh, are, are on the policy coverage provisions looking at taking uh, issue with uh, the court's reasoning in relation to incident, whether or not in relation to the, the, that wording in the triggers, in particular as <coughs> exemplified by QB2 and 3, that doesn't mean that the cover is intended only to cover disease within 25 one mile limits. They're also taking some quantum points to do with the extent to which pre-trigger -trig, pre COVID-19 related negative effects on revenue should be taken into account to reduce the indemnities and other trigger issues to do with prevention of access and hybrid wordings in relation to whether or not those require force of law and also uh, the questions of whether or not certain prevention of access and hybrid wordings require total closure of the business and fundamental changes or a prohibition on a substantial part of the customer base. Uh, 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 those are the points so far the FCA have, have identified as, as them taking on the insurer's side uh, they seem to be taking a broader approach and it might be said look like they're wanting to more or less substantially re-argue most of the points uh, before the Supreme Court. So over to Jay. Thank you, Hugh. I'm, um, I, I, I'm speaking on causation and trends and, and they're closely linked, although um, conceptually different. Um, causation is obviously uh an important requirement that needs to be established trends arises as a result of provisions that um you'll find in almost every bi policy uh the the, the trends clause itself uh concerns loss um but the reason why uh they're so closely related is because a typical trends clause and from the policies i've seen they're almost all identical um they're derived from uh, the standard precedent that you can find in McGill, McGill of Array. Um, but what that standard clause basically says is um, that when loss is computed, if there is responsive cover and causation is established because of provisions in the BI policy, these trends clauses, uh, which read something along the the insurer is entitled to make such adjustments as shall be necessary to provide for the trend of the business uh, and for variations in relation to special circumstances that arise either before image, um, they can take that into account in their loss computation. And the result, the, the potential absurd result is that uh, if the insurers have their way or had their way in the high court, what they were trying to argue was, well, even if there's responsive cover, even if the peril caused the loss, that they're entitled to effectively reduce that loss down to nil because they're entitled to take into account the uh, wider impact of uh, the disease, uh, the rules requiring people to stay at home. And so the effect of all of that would have been that any loss would have been reduced. So they're very, they're very closely linked. Um, the general principle in insurance law is as set out on the slide. Um, almost everyone on this uh, webinar will, will, will understand but for principles. Uh, the extract, the important points to kind of identify from that ex extract um, is that it's not the first, the last, or the sole cause of the loss. It's the dominant, effective, or operative cause. Um, it's all well and easy to uh, state that, but in certain cases, it can be very difficult to apply. So in an orthodox case of fire damage, it's, it's very easy. Uh, the difficulty arises when there's a chain of events. Uh, where there's two proximate causes. And there's been a potentially unfortunate distinction that's been interdependent and independent causes. 
So where there's two or more concurrent and interdependent proximate causes, the insured is okay um, because but for causation can be satisfied. So the authority for that proposition goes back to Miss JJ. So provided that second uh, cause is not itself excluded, even if it's not covered, as long as it's not expressly excluded under the policy, but one of the causes is covered by the policy, the insured will get home. So Miss JJ was a case where there was um, a design defect to a hull, a, a, a ship was traveling in um, tempestuous weather. Um, neither of those issues in itself would have caused uh, the damage that the vessel actually sustained, but the two of them operating together at the same time was enough to lead to that damage. And so but for causation could be established in that case. Very different situation when it comes to independent causes, uh, because under this, there's two concurrent proximate independent causes, the but for test won't be satisfied. And a very good example of that is the case of Orient Express, which um, I don't, if, if anyone's actually read the case in full, uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult case to get your head around. And um, most practitioners' spidey senses will be tingling because um, and most practitioners probably thought it was wrongly decided. And, and now decided as uh, damage that was sustained to a hotel uh, by two hurricanes uh, hurricane katrina was 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 the bigger of the two hurricanes and like any big hurricane not only was the insurance property the hotel very badly damaged but the whole surrounding areas everyone will remember uh, was absolutely devastated there were orders requiring people to leave the city of new orleans and so the insured, the hotel, uh, brought a arbitration claim because there was an arbitration clause under its policy because the insurer would only cover certain losses. So it would cover uh, the prevention of access and the loss of immunity cover, but that was set at a much lower level than the business interruption insurance cover. And so that was where the battleground was, was whether the, 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 the BI cover was, was responsive um, and whether the insurer had to pay out under the BI cover. Um, the interesting issues that come out of that case are causation and loss and trends, so loss, loss issues, uh, because what the insurer said, and this was accepted both by the tribunal, so the arbitral tribunal in Florida included um, uh, Judge Leggett, uh, so it was a very distinguished tribunal. The appeal from that decision went to Mr. Justice Hamblin, as he then was, uh, who's uh, now been eligible to the Supreme Court and we'll be hearing this appeal. So it should be very, very interesting because the high court in the test case effectively said, we don't need to decide that it was wrongly decided for the purposes of, of, of the test case. But if we had to, we would have decided it was wrongly decided for reasons which I'll come to. What the insured did, and this was accepted at both levels in Orient Express, is it said, well, if you but for causation based on the test that I just went through um, and based on the independent uh, causes, so two, two uh, proximate independent causes, the appropriate counterfactual that you're supposed to apply is uh, one where um, you've got a undamaged hotel, which is surrounded by a devastated city. And so that was the hypothetical counterfactual that was run and accepted. And of course, the, the, the obvious issue that pops up when, when that counterfactual is used is, well, you would have suffered that loss in any event, because even if the, the hotel hadn't been damaged, no one would be coming to the hotel um, and those losses would have, would, have res, would have resulted anyways. And so that was accepted, as I said, uh, both um, by the tribunal, distinguished tribunal, and by the high court. It's highly, highly questionable because, um, You've got this absurd situation. This was recognized by the high court uh, in the test case where the smaller the fortuity, the smaller the, the perilous event that is covered, the more cover there would be. Whereas the larger the fortuity, the larger the hurricane, the larger the event, the less cover there would be, which is, which is obviously um, an absurd situation. 
Um, but that was the situation that existed until the, the High Court uh, in the test case seized itself of this issue. Um, so in that case, it um, had the effect that uh, even though there was responsive cover, the hotel would have recovered nothing because the losses they were seeking to cover hadn't been caused by the event. And even if they had, that loss would have been reduced to nil under the trends clause. Hamplin in that case did recognize that in certain cases, and that these principles were derived from, from the law of tort, but he did recognize that in certain cases, it would be appropriate to import into the law of contract and insurance contracts, a departure from the general rule of but-for causation where fairness and reasonableness dictate that that should be the outcome. But he obviously didn't think that this was that type of case, which is also quite surprising. What he had done to get himself to that, he had looked at a number of factors, but two of the key factors was, well, he tried to apply other hypothetical counterfactuals. And his view was that there's other hypothetical counterfactuals. So uh, an undamaged hotel surrounded by an undamaged city would have produced too much loss and other counterfactuals would have produced too little loss. And he was also satisfied that there was cover under the policy under the POA and the LOA extensions. So for those reasons, he held that it wasn't appropriate in that case. It's, it's been heavily criticized as a decision and it was just waiting for someone uh, or, or some court to seize itself of, of, of the issue um, and to reconsider it. Uh, so as I said, in the test case, the, the, the high court was, was very critical of the judgment, but they didn't really need uh, to uh, decide that it had been wrongly decided to come to the conclusions that they did in the test case. The reasons why they uh, were of the view that it was wrongly decided, uh, there were three kind of key reasons. Um, <laughs> this is why it'll be really interesting on the appeal to the Supreme Court because they, they, they both, in terms of fallacy one, uh, the high court judges were both surprised was the language that they used that, that, that Hamblin, as he then was, had conflated and 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 it, it should be remembered that Mr. Justice Hamlin's background before coming to the bench uh, was in commercial and insurance law, but he had conflated a, a very basic issue and it's 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 almost a matter of first principles. So he had conflated the insured peril with the victim, and he had been so uh, stuck in and concentrated on on the damage component that he had forgotten that actually the insured peril was 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 hurricanes. These were all risk insurance policies. Hurricanes weren't accepted. Um, and that the focus on damage distracted him from the fact that that actually covered by the policy and he shouldn't have been focusing on damage. He should have been focusing on the insured peril. His second fallacy, I've already alighted to it. Um, and, I, you know, an undergraduate law student reading that judgment would uh, be surprised, I would suggest, that you can have this absurd situation where uh, the smaller the fortuity, the more cover there would be. The larger the fortuity, the less cover there would be. Um, so that was something that 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 the High Court in the test case really alighted to, because what they said is, as a matter of construction, that type of absurdity leaned heavily against construing the policy and Orient Express in the way that Hamblin did, in the way that the tribunal before him did. And then the third fallacy relates to the trends clause. And it's 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 effectively that once you take into account fallacies one and two, um, the way he approached the trends clause was, was also wrong. Uh, because if you accept fallacy one and you accept fallacy two, um, then damage to the hotel plus damage to the wider area should be stripped out. So actually the appropriate hypothetical counterfactual should have been an undamaged hotel surrounded by an undamaged city rather than a undamaged hotel surrounded by a devastated city. In the test case, they didn't need to go that far, as I've said, because uh, they resolved it mentally as a matter of construction. And uh, they've alighted to some of the points that, um, that, that Hugh has mentioned, but in the context of composite or compound perils, you need to take the whole, you can't, you can't just look at parts and then disclaim the other parts. So the three examples that are provided, uh, the first of all is, is the prevention of access composite. Um, you can see that there's, there's three components to that. 
and B and C are quite important. So you can't disclaim B and C from the reckoning. And once you accept that that's the case, the counterfactual that ought to be applied, that hypothetical counterfactual for the purposes of but for causation is one where you, you need to strip out all three. So you can't argue as the insurers were trying to do um, that the wider restrictions should be brought into the reckoning to prevent an insurer from establishing causation because they're actually fundamentally part of the cover that's in play. In terms of the second issue, the public authorities hybrid, it's, it's the same point. There's three components there. And you can't strip out the restrictions imposed, B, from the entire reckoning. So once that's accepted, all of it needs to be brought into the reckoning. And for the purposes of but-for causation, you need to strip out all three. So those wider issues that the insurers were trying to, to, to rely upon um, can't be used against the insured as part of an absurd counterfactual. And then in terms of the third one, you need to strip out disease within and also outside the area. So it's very, very good news from the perspective of uh, just lawyers and, and insureds generally, because if the Supreme Court upholds what the High Court found in, in this test case, uh, that will radically alter uh, how courts approach the matter of causation. It's obviously very good news in the context of business interruption insurance, but there's, there's much wider implications here. Um, what will be quite interesting on the appeal is uh, the insurers will, will, will effectively have to try and challenge both um, because for them to get home, they will have to show that Orient Express was, was rightly decided, but they will also have to displace the high court's rulings when it comes to construction of the composite uh, packages. Um, so with all that in mind, I'm going to pass over to James. I've got a slide of a, it's the, my best attempt to find an undamaged hotel surrounded by an undamaged area. It's surprisingly very difficult to find free photos on the internet, uh, which, which, which make that out. But the point is, is that the counterfactual, as I said, in Orient Express was, was wrong. So, so the high court says in the test case. And uh, this is all very good news from, from the purposes of uh, the insureds because um, you could have a situation, and I think uh, Hugh has mentioned them as banana skins in the past, where you can overcome all the difficulties of, of, of cover um, and then get to a situation where you're burned on causation and you're burned on loss. And uh, if, if the high court's approach is approved, then uh, we won't have to worry about those banana skins if you're an insured. Thank, thank you, Jay. So we move now away from the legal to the practical. And I, I suppose ultimately the question of, in any case, where is COVID? That might seem like a, a bit of a, an absurd question to ask. But as Hugh said at the outset, as he was taking us through some of the uh, policy wordings in question, a number of them, for example, RSA 3, QBE 2, um, rely upon an incident or an occurrence of a notifiable disease within a certain radius of the insured's premises. Where you have that sort of cover, there are two issues that arise. <clears throat> First of all, you are going to need to show that uh, an incident or a notifiable disease uh, occurred, within the, occurred within the relevant geography. Secondly, you're going to have to show the date of the occurrence, uh, and that's going to be important before you come on to the causation questions. So uh, as well as seeking decisions on the interpretation points, the SCA was also seeking decisions or guidance on these practical points. How is it that an insured in any individual case would be able to prove that there had been an occurrence um, within a certain radius of their premises, uh, allowing, allowing cover under the policy to be triggered? The third bullet point um, on the slide effectively set out what the, the SCA was seeking to do. Uh, they were seeking, uh, first of all, a decision on what type of proof would be sufficient. Uh, and then they were seeking a decision that, well, uh, assuming that um, the evidence that the SCA was putting before the court was the best evidence available, if an insured could present that evidence, um, they wanted a decision that it, it gave rise to a prima facie case uh, effectively requiring an insurer to disprove um, the occurrence 
of COVID within a certain radius of the premises. So, so really not quite a tick box, but they were certainly looking for almost a, a flowchart decision in terms of, well, this is what an insured is going to need to do in any individual case to demonstrate the relevant events and therefore trigger cover under the policy. I'm going to start um, actually at the end of the judgment with a spoiler and the court was not willing to go down that line for the very simple reason that this is a factual issue rather than a legal issue and it, even leaving aside questions of um, what issues expert evidence was required on ultimately that the court re-emphasized that the burden of proof is always going to be on the insured and that factual questions are going to be determined on the circumstances of each and every individual claim. At that point notwithstanding though, the judgment is quite helpful because it contains discussion both in terms of the court's view but also uh, the FCA and the insurer's view on the different types of evidence available and although the COVID situation has developed over the past couple of months, um, that sort of evidence is still going to be the primary evidence the parties are going to. So the various considerations and criticisms of that evidence give some practical guidance that will hopefully help um, litigants on both the insured and the insurer side if this sort of case. In its um, pleading, the FCA identified four different types of evidence that it said as a matter of principle should be sufficient to establish the occurrence of COVID. And again, we're looking at occurrence, not just in general terms, but in a specific geographical area and also on a date. And as set out on the, side, the slide, they were specific evidence. Um, that is to say, direct or indirect evidence of specific cases of COVID. And an example they gave was, well, if, for example, there were newspaper reports of an outbreak at a care home, that would be specific evidence of COVID in a particular locality. Secondly, there's the NHS death data, um, and that is people dying within 28 days of having a diagnosis of COVID. Thirdly, there is the ONS death data, and that is people who have COVID recorded on their death certificate as a cause of death. And then thirdly, there are the daily reported cases figures, and the link that I've included at the bottom is a link to the government's COVID dashboard where um, various statistics are, are publicised on a daily basis, showing not just the overall figures, but also things like trends um, in the figures. What followed it, or what follows in the judgment is, as I say, quite an interesting discussion of the limitations of the, the different types of evidence. Um, I think we can all accept that specific data or specific evidence is going to be probably the best evidence that is available. And if you have specific evidence of COVID, you don't need to go any further. NHS death data it is potentially helpful. It was the, the point that was made, but really it's subject to some significant limitations. Um, one of those limitations is in terms of geography, because NHS death data is collated on a hospital trust basis. Now, there will be some hospital trusts that include a single hospital. So if you have that single hospital within your, for example, 25 mile radius of the insured premises, you're going to be able to say there have been cases of COVID um, within the relevant area. But if you have a multi-hospital trust, some inside the area, some outside of the area, then actually it becomes much less helpful. There is also the problem with NHS deaths data that it is simply looking at deaths generally within 28 days of diagnosis of COVID. It does not necessarily tell you what the cause of death was. So it's possible that someone has recovered from COVID within that 28 day period and then died of something else. So all the NHS data really tells you is that at some point in the past there was a diagnosis. So in that sense, looking at the, um, the, the chronological element of, of prevalence and proof, it's not particularly helpful. ONS data, on the other hand, is more in terms of looking at because ONS is accepted on the insurer's side, um, because it includes the cause of death on the death certificate, one can assume that on the date of death, the individual or individuals had COVID. So you have a, a date, a fixed determinable date or dates where there were cases of COVID. Of course, geography is still a difficulty with the ONS data, because the ONS data 
is collated on different geographical bases. Normally, it's collated by what's known as upper tier local authorities and lower tier local authorities. So effectively, county councils and district councils. And you're not actually able to go any more specific than that. So like with the NHS data, if you had a very small district council or, or for example, if you, if you had a, you know, a, a unitary authority within a city where the entirety of that lower tier local authority fell within the 25 mile radius of the insured premises, that would be fine. Otherwise, you're likely to have difficulties because you have um, two areas that simply don't overlap. Because of that, um, what the FCA effectively sought was rubber stamping of, of two different types of methodology um, that it said could be applied to the underlying data in order to give a more um, reliable picture uh, and therefore set up the rebuttable presumption that they said um, it should be capable of being set up in this sort of case. And there were two types of methodology that they proposed. And again, the insurers were realistic about it. They didn't say, well, that methodology can never be good enough. But they made what I think is the fair point that how good it is, is really something that it has to be the subject of expert evidence. It needs to be examined in detail. It, it, it's not something that can be determined on a broad sweeping basis on a test case. Now, the two types of methodology um, are, first of all, what's known as averaging methodology. And that is where one might say, well, in a certain geographical area, we have 100 cases. The population in that area is 100,000. Um, because of that, we have one case in a thousand. So if I have a subset of that area, for example, the 25 mile radius around the insured premises and a thousand people live in that area, then on the balance of probabilities, there is likely to have been a COVID case in that area. Now, in a mathematical sense, it works very well, which is, of course, why the insured accepts that in principle it might work. But in a practical sense, one can obviously see there are huge problems with it because we're going to have issues of um, not simply population distribution uh, across an area. It, it doesn't follow that if you have 10% um, of a, a lower tier local authority, for example, by way of um, physical area, that's going to be 10% of the population. It, it also doesn't follow that you're going to have a, a characteristic population mix. Perhaps most importantly, though, and I personally think this is really demonstrated by the present situation where we see a national picture of much more localised outbreaks, it doesn't take into account that this is an infectious disease that tends to, to break out in clusters. So you don't tend to have a number of cases spread evenly. You tend to have a cluster in one area and then there's much higher prevalence in that area and then things are spread out much more generally. Now, because of that, there are real limits with averaging methodology and sort of averaging methodology. You would need, in, in my view, pretty convincing expert evidence to explain why and how your averaging methodology uh, was appropriate and was reliable. So considering those issues, as I say, not simply population density and um, the, the, the composition of the population in terms of um, age, ethnic minority, etc., but also looking at questions of clusters and how we can be sure of cases taking place outside of clusters. Now, the second type of methodology that um, the FCA was saying could be undertaken was what's known as undercounting. Uh, that is to say, predicting from the number of reported cases um, how many cases there had actually been. And obviously, this is more of an issue for the period before mass testing came in. Because, of course, in um, March, April, May of this year, it, there was only targeted testing of, of people primarily in um, hospital settings, whereas now we have wider community testing. And there is a widespread view that the targeted testing was only picking up a small percentage of the people who had COVID. But again, you have this complicated question of, um, it, yes, it should be possible to go from the actual test results that where we have confirmed cases to a broader estimate of infection levels. But how do you do that and how do you do that reliably? Now, the FCA sought to um, rely upon two important academic works, one study by um, Imperial College, another study by the University of Cambridge. Uh, they said these are the foremost um, 
uh, studies in this area. They are the most reliable. The court should accept them. The insurer said and the court accepted, well, uh, whether or not they're reliable and, and they can be um, relied upon in these sort of cases um, it is something that's going to need to be considered on the evidence. There needs to be an, an in-depth and direct consideration of the methodology adopted in those studies because it may be that a more appropriate methodology could be found. And really, and partly because of those two issues, um, the court was very cold on the idea that, that somehow this was an area where rebuttable presumptions could easily be set up, uh, whereby the burden of proof could effectively be shifted onto the insurers. Now, I'll cover the Equitas case quite quickly, um, simply it was the basis upon which the FCA ran the argument that in areas where exact proof is difficult, um, it is enough that you simply leave the best evidence available. And if the best evidence is enough to set up a prima facie case, then effectively the burden of proof should pass. That works as a matter of law, uh, and that was established in the in the Equitas case. Um, but, but again, on the fact of the here, it, it was found not to apply by the court, uh, largely because they didn't really have the evidence in front of them to determine whether or not they had the best evidence of um, either the, the correct averaging methodology or, or the correct uh, way of turning the, the number of reported cases cases within the community. So what conclusions could be drawn? Well, really, as I've already said, the the judgment is is simply a commentary on on some of the evidence, with the the, the court largely repeating a, a lot of the the objections noted by the insurers in terms of the weaknesses of the evidence. And anyone looking to bring this sort of case is is probably well advised to have a look at the views that the court took in terms of where the evidence can be relied upon to show occurrences within a certain area on certain dates and where it can't and then to, to build their case appropriately and really what it comes down to the court said is actually we got this evidence sent real dispute about where it can be relied upon and where it can't the real issue here is one of averaging methodologies how do we turn that evidence of broader figures into something more specific and Although that was the real issue, because there was no expert evidence on that point, the court couldn't say, well, this was the correct approach and, and that was the wrong approach. And so really, if you're looking to bring this sort of case, it's really all about averaging methodology. How are you going to go from the nationally available figures to something that lets you say with a degree of confidence, this is likely the number of figures in this geography state range? Um, the the court also made what I think is is quite a good point in relation to the FCA's reliance upon the Imperial and the Cambridge studies to say that there'd been a conflation effectively of the issues of reliability and relevance, that the FCA might have been right that these were the most reliable studies of their kind because they're the most authoritative, but that didn't mean that they were necessarily the most relevant. And really, in looking at the correct evidence, we are looking for the most relevant evidence. So although the evidence might not be nationally the most authoritative, if you are looking at rates within a certain area, evidence that specifically addresses individual or local factors of um, population density, age, ethnicity, etc., is going to be far more reliable than broader, more authoritative um, research papers or, or um, methodologies uh, adopted at a national level. Uh, and again, it seems to me that that is pretty sound advice for anyone looking at this sort of case. So stepping back then, we can't really say um, much for sure, um, save that there's, it seems fairly well accepted limitations in the data we have available. And as I've already said, if you want to run this sort of case where it requires you to prove um, the occurrence of a disease within a geographical area, within a period, unless you have specific evidence of COVID, for example, newspaper reports of an outbreak in a care home or a school, or witnesses who are going to be able to come and give that evidence themselves, um, what you need to be looking at is expert evidence on methodology. How is it you are going to turn the national figures into something that tells about what happened in the particular locality?
Um, that brings us to the end of the talk. If anyone has any questions, we're more than happy to answer them via the chat function. Um, alternatively, if anyone's feeling particularly brave and gregarious, feel free to switch on your camera and microphone and, and say hello to the crowd. Well, thank you very much, James, and thank you everyone for uh, attending the seminar. Uh, hopefully it's been a useful introduction to the talk overall. We've got a question in um, already from Natalie Pring. So the question arises, I think, from Natalie, which is uh, where uh, they're told by their insurer that um, they don't have cover, so they didn't submit a formal claim. Will they have the ability to make a claim now, assuming the appeal also goes in the insurer's favour? Um, that will, I'm afraid, be dependent on the specific provisions in the insurance cover to some degree, but uh, probably it's quite likely uh, that uh, the insurer would be on a sticky wicket um, in those circumstances. There, there may be some form of estoppel perhaps or, or argument that the, the uh, insured could raise. I don't know whether well, it would be an estoppel, but certainly it seems to me that if the insured has made contact with the insurer and they're told specifically by the insurer they don't have a claim, uh, I think the insurer is going to struggle um, with the notion that it can rely on in those circumstances on a uh, uh, provision in the policy which requires notification within a similar period or similar. So short answer is I wouldn't give up hope on that. And uh, it, it, I think you would probably be quite likely to be able to prevail and get over any arguments that might be subject, of course, to the wording of the policy. Yeah. Um, can, can I just mention uh, before any other further questions potentially come that, that the materials will be provided to you. So um, there's quite a lot of detail in the slides and um, they'll be sent out to, to all the attendees uh, at some point today, hopefully. So you'll have a copy of the slides. They'll also be uploaded on our website if, um, yeah. if, if you'd like to access them there. Any further questions? I think the main question I've got for James is is that uh, it, it, it seems like his favourite pet is obviously the cat. Uh, well, I mean, Jay was complaining about the difficulty of finding certain pictures on the internet. There's one sort of picture you'll never struggle to find on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the interesting issues, just just well. We're waiting for any further questions, if any, um, James. Is I've I've seen quite a few, especially for for you know uh, small smaller companies uh, and issues that have come across my desk, where it's actually mentioned. To take for example a pub or or a small cafe where um, they actually know of people who attended um, who did uh, suffer from from COVID symptoms and and may well have gotten tested. So. Um, Coming back to the evidential point, obviously the, the, the best starting point would be actual evidence rather than having to rely on presumptions. And it, it strikes me that for a lot of, especially on the smaller side where there's very local and loyal customers, that um, there might be an opportunity there for the business to uh, make inquiries of its own customers um, as to what their position was at, at the relevant time. And that might be a useful way of um, Obtaining evidence that 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 will hopefully be sufficient to uh, put forward without having to rely on these presumptions. No, agreed. I mean, the starting point is always going to be if you can get specific evidence that that is going to be the best. I suppose the example of a of a local pub, if you've got a fairly loyal and stable customer base, um, you are going to have a a certain number of people that you can fairly easily ask who may well be able to identify amongst their number someone that's had symptoms. I suppose if we do see claims arising out of a second peak, um, it may be that the test and trace scheme with everyone giving their details whenever they go to a restaurant actually becomes very useful um, in that sense. Though, though there might be reliability issues in relation to people who visited the pub for other reasons, Jay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and one, one question is how many proprietors will be giving specific evidence that they had COVID on the uh, on the dating question? 
Well, we, we'll discover all sorts of new cures, no doubt, for uh, for us as a result of uh, uh, cocktails and mixes that they're promulgating. But um, uh, on on a more serious note, though, I think probably Jay's right to emphasise that the tricky area which arises uh, out of COVID-19, which remains an open question following the FCA decision, is uh, it's not not actually going to be that straightforward for people to prove prevalence in small areas. Uh, it depends on the policy wording, doesn't it? 25 miles is obviously a very different kettle of fish from one mile. I mean, one mile radius is, if my maths are correct, it's pi r squared, isn't it? So it's yeah. um, it's sort of just over three three square miles. Um, uh, 25 obviously is a much bigger area, uh, easier to prove. And it may work. I, I, I was hoping you were going to work that out as well, Hugh. <laughs> so it, it may well be that um, scenario where actually for certain categories of cases, once the once we've got a bit further in terms of the expert evidence, the analytical evidence, you you end up with categories of cases which are easier to prove than others. Uh, in terms of the type of expert, um, James, do you want to share any of your thoughts on that as to uh, I mean, my immediate view is when I look to this is you're probably looking at um, uh, certainly some forensic accountants being people who could adequately deal with these matters. You might want someone with more mathematical skills than actuarial than, scientists or, 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 or act, act, actu actuarial actuarial uh, experts may be the, the, the main area. But I don't know if, if you or Jay have uh, got any thoughts you want to share on that. Well, obviously, someone with a strong statistical background, I mean, I, I think as, as well as expertise, part of the difficulty may well be actually the expert having the data they need to carry out the necessary calculations, because a lot of it is, is just common sense in terms of looking at things like population composition and density. But are they going to be able to obtain the data on population composition and density to enable them to undertake the relevant calculations? Yeah, well, I suppose that's why the FCA was trying to press things as far as they could to help ins insureds uh, not not have a, a, a sort of a position where uh, due to a difficulty in proof, they're not going to get home. And I think that the main message, I suppose, from the point from that point of view from the decision is, is that it doesn't look like the court is likely to to throw its hands up and say this is all far too difficult. Therefore, I'm not going to accept the claim. Whilst and the proof is on the insured, it does seem like they are willing and open to the idea of um, trying to use um, averaging methodologies. The real question is, is, is how accurate those can be and, yeah. and how much confidence you can get in relation to any particular geographical locations, I suppose. And it should be remembered, I mean, if all of this is upheld in the Supreme Court, at the, the, the FAS limit, um, I appreciate uh, Lawyers are probably not always necessary to bring complaints to FOS, but you're looking at £350,000. They apply a different test, um, a wishy-washy type of test, and I very much doubt that they will expect uh, the evidence or the proof to, to, to meet the standard that would be required in a court case. Um, and they'll probably approach the matter on a very proportionate, reasonable basis. Um, so there may well be different standards required for, for a FOS complaint uh, than in a court case. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I've noticed a few of our participants have been uh, forensic accountants and uh, experts, and a few of those might have already left uh, the meeting. But if there are any still to share any thoughts in relation to this particular topic in terms of prevalence proof, feel free to shout. Um, we welcome your input if you want to. I know there are still... Uh, just over 48 people on the call so it seems like people are interested in this particular topic if you want to share any of your own thoughts on it because uh, obviously people will have um, been mainly waiting the outcome of the FCA test case uh, before they take action on lots of uh, these business interruption claims and so it remains um, relatively uh, virgin ground so to speak in relation to how people are developing their cases. I suppose thinking um, back to Jay's point about specific evidence, one thing that might be helpful if, if you do have this sort of case is thinking logically through, well, where else can we go for specific evidence? Um, and the FCA's example of newspaper reports of um, a large number of deaths at a care home might actually be quite a helpful starting point because a lot of local newspapers um, will have carried stories where there has been a local outbreak, care home being an obvious one. But um, yeah. The Chew Valley Gazette, which I was reading yesterday, has a story about a pupil at Churchill School who has a case. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, it, it partly shows you know how that part of um, Somerset has been relatively uh, unaffected when um, it, it, it makes the local news that someone has had a case. But actually, local newspapers are probably going to be a prime source of, of evidence for this sort of thing, um, focusing on issues like care homes, schools, um, other, I suppose, community buildings or community events, where if there has been an outbreak or a case, it's more likely to have been reported. Yeah. Uh, but doesn't this doesn't this point throw up the, the the debate about prevalence? Doesn't it throw up the interesting point back throws us back to the interesting point about actually what these clauses are all about and what they're intended to cover? And it it, it, it seemed to me an interesting point which arose in relation to both the disease clauses and the prevention of access clauses. Is for example in the prevention of access clauses they talk about. Uh, um, government action taken as a result of, uh, of a danger. Now, it seems to me it's, it's well arguable that there is a danger, even if you don't have a COVID-19 specific outbreak in your area, because there's a danger, obviously, it's going to come your way. And that was the whole, that was the whole point of the, of the national lockdown, wasn't it? And, and so it, it does seem to me that, that all these issues might might be thrown out open for further debate in the Supreme Court. Um, so, so for the Supreme Court could be could be open to the argument of, of well, actually, um, why are we getting so bogged down in the question of proof in relation to specific areas? If, for example, you have a clause which which um, covers danger in, in that way. I mean, obviously, most of the prevention of access policies in this case were unsuccessful. Uh, on the reasoning adopted by the by the High Court, but um, nevertheless, there's reasoning in their judgment in the context of disease clauses, which might be said to uh, support the notion that COVID-19 isn't really easily divisible in this way, and that um, the risk of a, of a case nearby, even if it isn't within a locality, can cause a danger in action on the part of local authorities generally. So I think probably th these sorts of debates are mainly focused on disease clauses, aren't they, rather than uh, uh, rather than prevention of access clauses. But there may be an argument for saying prevention of access clauses, which you the, use the concept danger, should be viewed differently from the concept of proof. So ironically, you might have an easier argument in that context, even though the policy coverage issues look harder at the moment. No, no, I agree. It may be that actually these practical issues, um, which in some cases are going to be insurmountable, you can sidestep by looking at other clauses in the policy. Yeah. So that's worth bearing in mind, isn't it? it when people are looking at these things, it's, it's, it's not it, it, when you're analysing the case, obviously you take your step through your clauses, you do your tick box check, have I covered myself in terms of policy coverage? You obviously then I need to go and look at causation at the moment, as Jay says, um, policyholders are sitting reasonably pretty in that respect. And then you've got the sort of the, the third element, which is um, proof in relation to those items. But it, it's worth rethinking that analysis as in a joined up way, I suspect, in relation to to all of that. Um, hello, uh, Martin Wood, Devon Law. Yeah. Um, we are recently made a claim on behalf of the local sailing club because of loss of uh, interruption of business caused by COVID. Yeah. The response we have initially had, and I'm very pleased to hear your comments on the vicinity of the disease, is that um, they would not pay out based on the fact that we did not reliably have anybody within the sailing club who had visited it who had um, COVID, tested positive for COVID. So thank you. I think you cleared that one up very well. The second one is the only clause in which they are using to uh, on the claim is that um, they will only pay up the claim if the interruption of business or the closure of the club was caused by the order of a competent local authority. Any, uh, any comments on that issue? I think the, the first one you raised, point I raised, you dealt with. Um, specifically just the order of a competent local authority. Uh, any comments on that? Yeah, well, in relation to the question of, of both those points, obviously, Martin, you know, we'd emphasise that the, the, the concept and the use of the word vicinity was read by the court in the context of one policy, 
very differently than when it came to another policy. So I'm afraid um, the devil in the, is in the detail in relation to that. But uh, so I just wouldn't want you to uh, uh, necessarily jump to any conclusions as a result of what I've said in relation to one particular policy where the courts interpreted vicinity quite widely. Uh, in another policy, they viewed it more narrowly. So that, that was just sort of the first sort of point of warning I was going to give you. But, but secondly, in relation to the question of um, order of competent authority, that there, there is some discussion and debate about that. And generally speaking, the court seems to pro approach that quite widely. So a competent local authority in the context of one of the policies, for example, was interpreted to include government action as well. Um, so uh, it, for example, in the ecclesiastical insurance case, uh, somewhat, somewhat um, harmfully for the for the insured in that case they interpreted uh, an exclusion and reference to a local competent authority as including uh, national government action uh, and they referred to legislation which showed that uh, um, in the context that made sense in relation to that policy so i'm afraid martin it's sort of um, in relation to both those points there are some positive points for insureds in relation to those particular issues which might suggest uh, that you should have responsive cover, but uh, there are all, also other parts of the judgment which might be used against you, and and we'd need to understand a bit better, obviously, the, the whole of the policy to be able to advise on the specifics. Um, the, the one thing I would say, Martin, and this is just a general point, is um, we've, we've all probably seen the responses that come back from usually the loss adjusters uh, in point of, by the um, and 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 they seem to to be using the same template. So um, a lot of the responses I've seen um, are almost identical. And yeah. uh, I it's it's I, I don't think I've seen yet an insurer accept responsibility or liability immediately for any of this. It's um it's it's very much what you've seen is very much the way they've approached it generically. Yeah, I think probably there's sort of two things to point to arise out of that. One, Jay's quite right. There's a lots of lots, there's a lots of generic responses from insurers at the moment, which isn't actually necessarily properly tuned by reference to the policy wording. I suppose the other point we need to bear in mind, Jay, is, is lots of the uh, of the work which crosses our desk tends to be in circumstances where there's already a dispute. Um, yeah, so there, there, are, there are obviously some there are obviously some policies where the insurers have taken a, a different. Um, approach and attitude yeah um, uh, th th I think I think I think in general speaking they're a minority and I suppose also um, in fairness to them if they still think that they've got causation arguments to run in the Supreme Court they're unlikely to open their checkbook right now um, yeah, yeah. They, they, they will probably I suspect I'm, I'm afraid lots of insurers will probably still be waiting until the Supreme Court judgment before making any d final decisions on on paying out yeah Okay, well, thank you very much for that, gentlemen. It, it, it is helpful, and um, especially on the second issue I raised. Um, Good. Thank you very it. much. Thank you. Martin's question reminds me of an issue that I've seen arise quite often in relation to force majeure clauses, but might actually um, apply in this context as well. And uh, that's uh, I've seen a lot of cases where um, people have uh, either jumped the gun or they've tried to do what, what might be termed in inverted commas the right thing and have actually shut down businesses or limited their operations when they're not strictly obliged to by the regulations in force at the time. And I wonder if, and I've had a number of difficult cases like this, where everything else falls into place, but that, that effectively causation element in terms of showing that it's the government regulations, for example, or, or COVID that has caused them to, to shut or, or suffer the loss, um, can't be made out because that they've gone further than they needed to. Uh, that, that, what, that point that point was aired, James, in, in the FCA test case. So it doesn't maybe come through quite so much in in the actual judgment. You know, it was certainly a topic for debate at the hand down hearing in relation to the, the the precise wording in relation to the declarations. And interestingly, one of the insurers, uh, uh, the the name will probably come back to me shortly, but one of the insurers did indicate that if someone if an insured does the right thing in anticipation, for example, of regulations coming in and closes early, that they wouldn't be holding that against the insured for the purposes of assessing their losses, if you see what I mean. Um, 
but I don't I don't think there's yet a universal response from the insurers on that particular point. So again, it's sort of uh, and it's a matter of loss, isn't it? And everything moved really pretty quickly. So um, you're looking at at potentially days, I guess, between a business that that proactively took those steps and and then mandated closure. It's um, but it's one of the main FCA points is linked to that, which is uh, obviously you you for the purpose of the trends clause, you strip out um, everything that forms part of the peril. But before you have a trigger, um, which causes you to have cover, you have lots of businesses where they will have had, had a downturn as a result of COVID-19. Mm-hmm. And on the basis of the test judgment as it currently stands, those particular cases will probably be calculated on the basis of a reduced starting point in terms of mm-hmm. their turnover. So a point that the FCA are wanting to take to the Supreme Court is, is that right? If part of the insured peril um, uh, existed before in this context, COVID-19, should that be stripped out in relation to the assessment of losses, even if it predated uh, yeah. the, trigger, the, the, the trigger date? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, in a different it, it, uh, in a different context, a hurricane's coming, you know it's going to arrive in three days' time. Um, and, uh, exactly. it, you know, it, 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 something brewing, a, a, a peril that hasn't crystallized, but is, 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 is brewing. Exactly. So, it's so going you, to you, crystallize. You, you can see the Supreme Court being very interested in that point. So, yeah. so where, where policyholders take sensible precaution um, in anticipation of the insured peril arriving at their doorstep, mm-hmm. should that be stripped out? And that, that, that will be a big issue in the Supreme Court, I'm sure. Yeah, it, yep. it, it'll be a very interesting judgment. It'll probably be a, a, a long Supreme Court judgment too, um, a, against the grain of um, more recent judgments, which which are usually yeah. relatively. Yeah, the, the recent trend. The recent trend has been for more pithy judgments, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean they've got quite a few different arguments to deal with. So um, it remains to be seen, of course, whether or not all of it goes up. I mean the FCA are indicating that they want to try and. Uh, negotiate as much as they can with the insurers to close things off because part of their objective obviously is to deliver um, some money to insureds as quickly as they can because some insureds will obviously be facing solvency issues. Yeah. James, I think you were going to add something. Yeah, I I, I was simply going to say that that I've seen the issue rise not just in terms of people going a bit soon but but also um, and again from my own practice, mainly actually in relation to, to things like force majeure clauses, um, but people going further than they've needed to, misunderstanding by certain businesses or certain industries as to what they were and weren't able to do at the peak of the lockdown. Um, so it may well be that there are going to be an unfortunate category of cases where people, strictly speaking, weren't prevented from, from working, but have effectively shut themselves down when they didn't need to. Um, yeah. It's interesting, yeah. the whole takeaway function um, where some some stayed open, some didn't, and yeah. Um, so that will be a point open for debate as well, um, as to um, and and as ever with these things, with with any cases, there are some people who just, for reasons of good fortune, end up on one side of the line rather than the other, and um, uh, it's not always easy to to forecast that. But uh, it's also worth bearing in mind that this judgment, of course, has relevance to people looking at policies now and cover for the next year. Yeah. you know COVID's not going to go away and so you know people might be asked to advise prospectively on how they can assist with this but obviously there are, there are premiums which will have a bearing on that in terms of what sort of premiums insurers and insurers are, are willing to, to bargain for uh, but uh, I think we're probably going to wrap it up now it's 10 30 and we've we've uh, um, uh, start a little bit later, but um, I think that's probably unless there's anything else that um, anyone wants to um, raise. Hopefully, people have found that a useful uh, post-seminar discussion, and you never know for, for future seminars we could actually um, adopt a more of a, uh, a discussion format if people have an appetite for that um, with the smaller group sessions. That's something we can explore in due course with people if. Uh, if people have particular interest areas on certain specific clauses or certain areas, that may be something that we can look at in future. But um, as confirmed by Jay, the materials will be will be circulated and uploaded to everyone who attended.
And so unless there's anything else that Jay or James or any other participants want to raise, uh, thank you very much for listening and we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.